Hi guys, good evening. So, me Elon Bowman, Axie.com online personal for teaching zoology, the resource person. So, good evening to everybody. So, we started the lesson already just about the reptiles, the last class. And I showed you the classification, how far the animals are being classified, what is the criteria they used. So, the total animal reptiles being grouped under three, just actually five classes or subclasses. The class reptilia has been divided into five subclasses. This is based on what we call this one Fosa or vacuity. Also, we are using the word vacuity because this is the term used in examination. On what basis? Yes, happy evening, as a yes, follow it. So we have actually the question regarding just uh, vacuity. The Fosa otherwise called as vacuity. So the classification has been made based on the vacuity of Fosa. Accordingly, we have five subclasses. I here represent only three diagrams showing subclass one anapsida, synapsida, and, and which also two more classes that is good evening. So parapsida, euripsida. So in the case of synapsida and parapsida, we have only one Fosa vacuities. Now this is the Fosa. And here you see that one, there is no cavity. There is no cavity. And this one is nothing but the eye orbit. It's not a vacuity. And this one is a nasal aperture. So here we have in the case of synapsida, just only one vacuity. And this group includes only the extinct animals. No living representative for this one. Euripsida, then parapsida, synapsida, and all these subclasses include only the extinct forms. That's why we leave this one. So in the case of anapsida, there is no cavity. Now in the case of diapsida, the name itself implies that it has two cavities. You see that one, one and two. So this group includes both the living and as well as extinct forms. The living forms normally include three, just actually orders. We can say super orders. And all of this, even for example, the terrible lizard, what we can say is smile evening, good evening, smile evening also. So, so the diapsida includes the terrible lizards, the dinosaurs also coming under this category. So this is, these are all the diagrams showing how far the classification has been made. Now let's proceed towards the, the different subclasses. Subclass 1, anapsida, I mentioned already, includes only one living order. Only one living order. The name of the order, Chelonia. The name of the order, Chelonia. So you can see easily the, by way of seeing the diagrams. See that one, the turtle and tortoises and terrapins. I'll tell you what you mean by a terrapin. So, in the case of all these animals, we have a box like armor or an exoskeleton. So, the dorsal side, we have a thick exoskeleton that is called a carapace. The dorsal side, we have the carapace. On the ventral side, somewhat soft, not actually so much of rigid, what is called the plastron. The entire box being formed of a dorsal plate and a ventral plate. The dorsal plate is called as a carapace and the ventral one is called as a plastron. Okay, so what are the examples under this one? Kilo, the marine turtle. You know the only animal which can live for a long time. The marine turtle is normally called as a kilo, the largest one living for more than 300 years, the animal which is having a long lifespan in the animal kingdom is only the turtles living in marine water. Testudo, the land tortoise is always called as testudo, land tortoise. So, it's normally smaller in size, even also we have, that is the living lifespan is very much less when compared to the kilo. So, living for long, the animal with long lifespan, the turtles in the animal kingdom. So, the testudo is normally, is as an ornamental animal nowadays, you know that one, even some people are having this one as a pet animal in foreign countries. Now, another example, in this case, terrapin. So, you, you could not actually better not hear this word terrapin. You could have not hear this word terrapin. So, what is a terrapin? Just looking like, for example, a turtle or a tortoise. But in the case of this animal, the dorsal plate, what we call this one, the carapace is very soft and also the plastron. 
So carapace and then just actually the plaston, both are very soft indeed. So such animals living on land are called as terrapin, considered as a freshwater animal. So turtles are marine water and the testudum that is normally a freshwater. This one is also a freshwater. But in this one, some of the arrangement is different from that of test to do the top times where you have upper surface having a heavy plate and the lower surface is having somewhat just a less rigid plate. But here, soft cell freshwater terrapin. So the animal name, the scientific name, trionyx. Trionyx normally calls a terrapin. So I think so. You hear this word, a new word for you. You hear only that sturdy and tortoises. And this one is also similar to the tortoise or turtle, but it is a soft freshwater actually animal. Normally the shell is very soft, not very much rigid. So this includes only one representative for the subclass Narcida. No cavity or no vacuity in the skull of such animals. Now subclass 2 Diapsida. And this group includes both living members as well as extinct members. For example, it includes normally three superorders. We can say are simply order, superorder order. One, Rhynchocephalia. Number two, just actually square mat. That is also you have that one, and that which includes uh, normally just with the snakes and lizards, and also order Crocodilia. So it includes three living orders and a number of extinct orders. So one such animal which is normally extinct only. We have received more than just what we have, the fossils, what we call this one, the terrible lizard, the dinosaurs, once lived in the past, during actually the Mesozoic era. So that is normally happening there. So the surplus diapsida where you have two vacuity includes three orders. Order number one, Ringocephalia. Ringocephalia. So it includes only one representative. That too, that representative is restricted one in New Zealand. And that also a peculiar character for this animal, it is considered as a living fossil. A living fossil. So the name of the animal is Spinodon. Normally called as Tuatara lizard or Hatteria. Tuatara lizard or Hatteria. So why is it called as a living fossil? I already discussed about this one under invertebrata. For example, one mollusk, neoplina, or the king crab, limulus. These are all living fossils. It's an animal which has remained unchanged over millions of years. So it has the characteristics of what it had when it originated in this earth. An animal which has remained unchanged over millions of years. Even if we can say an animal refused the evolution. Even we can say the animal which is not responding to evolution. Evolution means complexity increases with modification, progression occurs. But here there is no change. The animal has the same characteristics what it had been originated during that past years. So this animal shows only just what is the localized distribution, a restricted distribution found only in New Zealand. So this is the animal to Atara. This is the diagrammatic one and this is the real animal photograph. Now order square matter, the second order. So it includes two sub-orders, one Lesotheria, all those animals, the crawling animals with the tail, with the limbs, for example the lizards. And another one, Ophidia, Ophiology, the study of stain. So, Normally, herpetology, the study of reptiles. Then we have saurology, the study of what is called the lizards. And ophidia, ophiology, the study of snakes. Ophiology. Even in some cases, we are using the word, for example, ophiocephalus in the case of one fish, a snake headed fish. So, ophiology, the study of snake. So, we have that subordus plus the tibia, the animals having two pairs of limbs and a tail. And the sub-order of Ophidia includes animals without limbs. So this is called the tailless squamat. Tailless squamatans are animals, normally we can see the snakes. Now what are the examples for this Lazatelia? We are not going to describe anything about that one. Simply we have to know the main difference between these two. So two pairs of limbs and no limbs at all in the case of snake, we know that one. 
So our common houseless uh, hemidactylus, hemidactylus, the one which is known for autotomy, the one which is known for autotomy. What is autotomy? Self amputation, self mutilation, self amputation or self mutilation. So it is the best example. This hemidactylus is a houseless. When the enemy is approaching, what will happen? It cuts its own tail and goes away. The tail is friendly, attracting the enemy. So the enemy is actually conservation is diverted. So this phenomenon of cutting its own part of the body is called autotomy or self mutilation or self amputation. That means the animal has high power of regeneration because the last tail once again has been regenerated after it has been cut by its own nerve. So that is what we have in the case of hemidactyly known for, that is hemidactyly is known for autotone. Then drag, we will see that picture later, a flying lizard. So the skin between the fore and hind legs actually being extended, supported with some ribs, just like what we have the wings as in the case of birds. So autotone, what is called self mutilation. Self mutilation. Self mutilation or self amputation. Amputation. So amputation means cutting its own body. So, it is also called self-mutilation, not mutation, mutilation or self-amputation. Then, grab a flying lizard and another one you know that one, the camellia. That animal has the ability of changing its color, you know that one. According to the situation of the surrounding, the pigmentation of that animal has been changed, camellia. And the one that giant, just what we call Gila monster. Hilodema. So the only poisonous lizard, the only poisonous lizard, Hilodema. Then, normally you see in the case of snakes, only no limbs are formed. But in one lizard, it's also shiny nature, looking like a glass. And that one is Ophiosaurus, Ophiosaurus, a leafless actually lizard, commonly known as grass snake. So because of absence of limbs, it is called a snake. It's very shiny, we see in the picture. So, the Heloderma, the only just lizard which is normally poisonous in age. And Ophiosaurus, Ophio I mentioned already, just referring to snake, the meaning for that one. So the Ophiosaurus, because lizard, the study of lizard is called saurology, hence the name Ophiosaurus, a lipless glass, actually lizard. As it is looking like a snake, the name is given as snake glass snake very shiny. Then some order of video which includes all the snakes. One, you know that one, the deadly poisonous one, Naja, Naja Hanna, Naja Naja, the common cobra and also the king cobra. Then the results viper, we have results viper, pits viper. Yes, so Ophiosaurus does not have lips. So, but it is included under what is called actually the order Placeteria. Because it has just the characteristics similar to that of the lizards. So in the case of lizards, they have clavicular aperture with the two copulated organs. That is one of the characteristics. And also we have some of the structures related to the eye region and also about the snout. So mainly the reason it has scales, though it has, even in the case of frog, we have studied one and limbless uh, frog, you know that one, the limbless amphibians, Gymnophiana, Sicilians, why is it included? Because it has skin having mucous glands. So likewise here, this one normally included under this one. The reason for that one, just normally though the animal has no limbs, it has characteristics, the reproductive characteristics, as well as for example the cleocular perch. So the cleocular perch is provided with the two copulatory organs in the case of male. That is very common in the case of lizards, not in the case of snakes. And even you know another characteristics. So normally in the case of reptiles, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. 12 pairs. But except snakes. So in the case of snakes, we have only 10 pairs of cranial nerves. 
as in the case of, for example, fishes and amphibians. There is an exception. The same character is also noticed in the case of Ophiosaurus, though it is normally a snake-like animal having 12 pairs of radial nerves, similar to that of what is called the lizard, that is why it has been included. So some of the it is one example, we are going one by one, it is not necessary. So normally, they are having such characteristics, so some common characteristics are actually selected for including this animal and the lizard here. One example I have given, 12 pairs of cranial nerves here, there you have 10 pairs. Then, Bungolus, the crate, the poisonous snake, and Hydrophis, sea snake. And then one question, how can you identify a sea snake? So as the animal is not, almost all the sea snakes are poisonous. 100% we can say all the marine snakes or sea snakes are poisonous. Suppose a snake is given to you. If it is a marine snake or a sea snake or an aquatic snake. So in the case of aquatic snake, you have the tail region has been flattened like a oar as the animal is normally moving for swimming purpose. So you can see the diagram also about this hydrophis. Okay, let's see some more about. Now here is a figure showing camellia. You see that one is tail is highly coiled like a spring and adaptation. So I mentioned about this Ophiosaurus, a glass snake, a nickname, a limbless lizard. So you see that one is shiny in nature, that's why the name is given. And also I mentioned why it is included under that is Lazatelia. Now this is the only, you see that one, the poisonous lizard, Gila monster, Hiloderma, this is the only poisonous lizard. And you see this is a flying lizard dragon. You see the wing, a structure which has been extended, a full of skin which has been extended between, that is the forelimb and the hind limb. So that is called as a potassium, as in the case of bat. So the animal can glide. Though it is called as a flying lizard, it can glide from one tree to another for a long distance, unlike other lizards. Now, this one is the largest lizard. Largest lizard. Suppose you have, for example, largest living reptile. Largest living reptile, crocodile. So you see the difference. This is the largest lizard. If we are taking, for example, the largest reptile, that is nothing but actually the crocodile. Or we have, for example, the alligator. The crocodile is largest reptile. Now this is the largest lizard, Varanus, Komodo dragon. So the largest lizard, but it is not poisonous. Unlike the Gila monster. So Varanus, Komodo dragon, and this is the largest lizard, remember in your mind. So the smallest lizard, we have Jekko. I will show you. The smallest lizard, Jekko. Now you see this way. Here the hydrophis I mentioned. You see this one, the tail region. You can find out easily one of the identification of the sea snake or a water snake. Say an example here, this is the identification by which easily by mere observation you can say that one and that is nothing but actually a water snake, particularly sea snake. Because always found, even the water snake also, the fresh water snake can come to land. But this one always there in water. That is why actually the tail region is being flat. The pink color one you see that one is being flat and just like a wall helping in uh, that is swimming purpose. Naja Naja. This is actually the common cobra. Naja Hanna. And that is what is called the king cobra. The largest deadly poisonous snake, the king cobra. So obvious actually Hanna or Naja Hanna, different names. So normal snake, the cobra, Naja Naja. Najahana, that is a king cobra, the longest and largest deadly poisonous snake in this world we have. Now the viper, Russell's viper. See that one? The animal which shows, the animal which shows what we have that is viviparity. Viviparity. Normally know that one, the reptilian forms lay their eggs, they are oviparous in nature. But this is an example for viviparity. So Russell's viper normally just not lay eggs, but normally they are giving birth at once. So that is a very best example in snake. Actually, we can say snake kingdom. That is viper Russell or Russell's viper, and that is the one 
which gives back m ones an example for viviparity. Remember, then Bumbalas, the crate. So we also there is one question came in the question paper regarding the vertebra. So if you have studied about the vertebra in the case of reptilian forms, you know that when it is procellus time, we have started already in the beginning. But what is the nature of uh, that is vertebra in the case of one person came? What is the nature of where you come across? Where you come across? A hexagonal vertebra. A hexagonal vertebra. One in Russell's viper or in Crite or in Cobra or any other water snakes. So it can have a hexagonal vertebra in the case of Crite. Hexagonal vertebra in the case of the shape. Hexagonal vertebra in the case of Crite. Remember. Now, while talking about no, so the anagona is entirely different. It's not a poisonous snake. Remember that one. Though it has been shown in the film, a huge one just actually causing damage. It's not a poisonous. It's not a poisonous. So we can say that it is not actually a category seven. So it is not a poisonous, but actually causing damage. Okay, so it's not poisonous, we can say easily. Now we are talking about, while we are talking about snake, there are some questions repeatedly asked also related to the poison and venom of snakes. That's why we have to somehow concentrate on this category. What is the nature of the venom and poison glands in snakes? See, we have the poison glands. These are all the modified parotid glands, one of the salivary glands, modified salivary glands and also just place over the labium so labrum upper jaw we can say labium just the lower jaw so it is superior labial gland as it is found over just superior to the lower jaw that is why it is also called a superior labial or parotid glands so one of the salivary glands so superior so the poison glands are modified parotid glands you can remember or superior labial glands now, what are the different types of snake venom? As more questions they are asking repeated based on the action they perform. So, some of the poisons are neurotoxins. So, to which organ they are profounding their effect? Or which organ has been poisoned? Or which organ has been actually affected? And based on this one, we have two types of venom. Number one, so there's actually normally we don't have act in the case of uh, non-poisonous snakes the glands never modified they are simply present so no remnant or just vestigial of poison apparatus in the case of non-poisonous snakes okay right because these are all the modified glands only so based on the nature of activity based on the nature of action we have two types of toxins or venom, what is neurotoxin? The name itself implies we see that one, it is always affecting the nervous system. So, by acting on nervous system, it causes the paralysis of uh, what is called the respiratory muscle. The breathing muscles are affected by this one, namely, for example, the diaphragm, even the intercostal muscles, etc., the rib muscles. So, by causing the paralysis, so that the person is unable to breathe, all of a sudden, death happens. So you can have this neurotoxin mainly in the case of cobra, crides and also the sea snakes. So this is a question came also, what is the type of toxin produced by cobra? You see that one neurotoxin, as it affects the nervous system. So in the nervous system, in the middle of oblongata, there is a center, what is called a respiratory center, found in the middle of oblongata. That respiratory center only controls the breathing movements, particularly the muscles activity. Those muscles involve in breathing. And here, the respiratory center, the middle of lungata region is affected. Once it is being affected, this toxin affects that center. Ultimately, it causes the paralysis of the respiratory muscle so that the person is unable to breathe. So, just what we have some sort of breathing problem leading to the death. So, the cobra venom is nothing but a neurotoxin. The same one also in the case of Christ as well as in the case of Hydrophys, the sea snakes. Don't forget the cobra venom affecting the nervous system. Now the second one, hematoxin. The name itself implies it causes damage mainly to the blood or circulatory system. See, it causes normally tissue lysis and destruction, particularly the blood cells are damaged. So when a person is normally bitten by cobra, immediately death happens. 
because it immediately spreads to the nervous system causing death. Or if a person is affected or bitten by, for example, the white person, it will take some time for the death of the individual. The reason for that one is spreading, causing only damage to the cells formed in the circulatory system. It takes some time. Even if we are just actually putting a knot, suppose we are bitten just actually in the wrist region, if we are putting knot just above this one, there is no just what will happen, damage occurs to the body. But in the case of neurotoxin, we cannot just prevent the spreading of the toxin to the nervous system. We cannot do it. That is why normally people are surviving if you are, if the persons or actually people are affected or bitten by, that is vipers. Now the vipers venom is an example for hemotoxin as it affects the circulatory system, that of the blood cells. Now this venom causes proteolysis. The venom contains actually, it is actually a proteolysis. That means it causes damage to the membrane of the blood cells. As it is formed up, you know, maybe the proteins. So those substances which cause damage are lysing the proteins are called proteolysins. So the viper venom has the ability of just damaging the plasma membrane of the blood cells in the form of proteolysins. So anyway, the hematoxin is an example for, actually the example of just we have the vipers and cobras for neurotoxin. Then, one more question also just I want to tell you because the question came in the question paper. Jacobson's organ or omeronasal organ, omer, you know your bone in your body also forms separating the two nasal apertures. Omeronasal organ, it is formed in the roof of the just actually mouth. And this is a chemoreceptor organ. Even you have another one what is called Johnston's organ, Johnston's. That is found in mosquitoes, in the antenna, Johnston's organ. And also that one is acting as actually touch receptor. And here the Jacobson's organ, also found in some cases of even rabbit, somehow actually not fully developed. So it is a nasal organ, a chemical reductor concerned with the sense of smell, olfactory sense, found in the roof of the mouth of snakes. So which one of the following animal has this Jacobson's organ, you can see definitely, mainly just the snakes, they have this one in the roof. Now, anti-venom or anti-venin, where it is normally produced, we have to know something else. So there is a Central Research Institute in Himachal Pradesh, where we are just actually preparing this anti-venom or anti-venin, just to neutralize the effect of what is called the venom of snake. So the anti-venom or anti-venin is in such a way, actually it's nothing but a modified form of the toxin released by the snake which will operate against the toxin to neutralize its effect. So there is one research institute in Amatsar in Himachal Pradesh and also another research institute in Mumbai what called this one Happings Institute. Happings Institute, I will name of the doctor. Then I mentioned already about the vertebra right is hexagonal. and this is also the question I mentioned about it. Hexagon the shape. And also about the tail of sea snake, that is also another question laterally compressed for its swimming movement. Then which is the largest snake, Najahana or Ophiophagus hanna, Ophiophagus hanna, the king cobra, it is the largest deadly poisonous snake. Then the smallest lizard I mentioned already, Jekko, is only just one to two inches, less than two inches, very small one. And the largest lizard already I mentioned, Commander Drogon, what we call this one scientifically, Baranus. These are all some of the information related to Now the last order under this one, order for Cadavia. So one peculiar character for all the individuals of this order for Cadavia, see normally in the case of uh, other reptiles, we have four chambered heart, but the chambers, particularly the ventricles are not completely divided. There is an opening is there between the two ventricles, there is a mixing of blood between the two ventricles. But it is an advanced actual reptilian form. Having four chambered heart, the hearts are completely divided. We have two atria, upper, and two ventricles, lower. So that is why here I mentioned heart is four chambered. Don't forget, this is completely divided heart, unlike other reptilian forms, either snakes or the lizards 
or we can have the turtles or tortoises there you have incompletely divided four chamber heart but in this case we have just the heart is four chamber now the, I mentioned already the largest lizard Komodo dragon but the largest living reptiles nothing but these animals now this order includes alligator crocodilus and gavialis now these are all the examples so alligator so only difference with the reference to actually so how does the jaco wax on wall this is actually they have a vacuum see at the tip of uh, each digit see that one there is a swollen pad the swollen pad is normally hollow on its lower side there is a concavity so there is a vacuum created just like you know that when there is something just being pressed against the wall you can see it is being just fixed in the same manner it is having concavity on its lowest side and then somewhat just convex on its upper side so even in the case of house lizard it is working like that by using just the limbs as a vacuum that's why it is crawling on the just actually the wall this is because of the vacuum mechanism formed just in the digits end so the structure pan on its lowest side there is a concavity so while it is pressing against it just like a rubber having a vacuum it is being fixed to the wall in such a way it can walk Then gavialis. You see the difference between the crocodilus. Then we have alligator. So the only difference about the snout. So in the case of gavialis, we have a long, just a snout, which is normally elongated. So I mentioned just what is the difference between alligator and crocodilus regarding mainly just about the snout. The snout is somewhat narrow. In the case of actually alligator and crocodiles, it is somewhat broader. That is main difference. Only external differences. There is no much internal anatomy. A little difference one. That is based on external morphological characters. By which you can see. That is about the snout. Based on the snout. And also some slight internal organization. Difference. Not much of difference. Only external morphology. Now you can differentiate that is crocodilus alligator from that of what is called gavialis by mere observation in the picture. You see that one? Here it is being elongated snout. An elongated snout is being formed in the case of gavialis, normally known as gavial or garial. Now, so far we have concluded about what we have the third class reptilian form with reference to the external morphology and some of the important characteristics related to. Now let's pass on to the fourth one under the tetrapoda class is Simply we can say feathered bipeds. So normally cattle, you know that one they call as a quadrupeds and here bipeds because they have two legs only. As the four limbs are modified wings, they are making some only the two limbs or two legs for walking or running simply. So I am using the word running how? So the crocodiles never chew their food. Though they have teeth, the teeth are thick or down in nature, pleuro down in nature, it never crushes. It is used as one just simply for capturing the food, for holding the food. Just we can see that, just what we can say in the case of crocodile, it has the ability of just capturing by holding. That is the teeth are used for that one, it never chews, it simply swallows it simply swallows it. The teeth are used mainly for just uh, cutting the body of uh, the prey and also capture. Okay. So the birds are warm-blooded. I mentioned already as the reptiles, birds and mammals are warm-blooded or endothermal as have the ability of just maintaining their body temperature or also homeothermous animals, the technical word. So regarding the evolution, how, when, so during the Mesozoic period or the Mesozoic era, we have three periods, Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. So during the Triassic period, we have started the origin of the reptilian forms. Then they flourish during what is called the Jurassic period. And finally, they just actually most of the reptiles came to extinct. For example, the dinosaurs. So our crocodiles are Europe definitely. So they are, though they are actually living in water, but for everything they have to come on land. See, they are laying eggs only, the reptilian eggs, and the eggs are normally leathery, sorry, leather-like. The shell is normally just a soft in nature, leather-like, 
and you can proceed I mentioned earlier it is also ureotelic it is also ureotelic excreting only urea as a base product so no exceptions in the case of reptilian forms all reptilian forms are concerned with excretion of urea no doubt about it including the birds also okay so they originated during the Jurassic period of Mesozoic era so like bird like animals what we call this one the dinosaurs so one type of dinosaur which can able to fly you have seen in the film and that is called Tyrosaurus we have some actually animals Dino this is a common name the dinosaur is a common name we have different animals some of them are living in water Ichthyosaurus, Stegosaurus like that this is a common name and we have one dinosaur having the wings just like in the case of Draco in between the two limbs an extension of skin used for flying but the animal never used for flight somehow and the Mesozoic era is considered as actually the golden sorry normally considered as a golden age of reptiles and from these animals are the advanced forms what we have the apes originate that is why they are simply considered as a glorified reptiles advanced adapted advanced more advanced than what we have the reptiles hence the name they are considered as a glorified reptiles now as a general rule as the birds you know that one they have feathers the feathers are nothing but the exoskeleton and they are used for flight and about the forelimbs you know the birds adaptations or the aerial adaptation the forelimbs get modified into wings for flight except in the case of flightless birds like penguin or for example ostrich or emu, tinamu etc you will see later kiwi so the flightless birds though they have the wings they cannot fly because of the more weight because of actually the muscles the flight muscles they will develop not for flight but they are rich in actually weight or more in weight and how can you say that these animals have been evolved from the reptilian forms one of the reptilian characters you have that is the scales the legs have epidermal scales so by which one can say normally this animal one of the actually that is criteria by which we can say that the animal has been uh, that is evolved from reptiles both reptiles you know that one the birds as well as the mammalian forms originate only from the reptiles in two different directions and that is what is called parallel evolution parallel evolution so in one direction we have the mammals and another direction we have the birds that is called the parallel evolution evolution of two groups in a parallel manner so the high winds have scales and you see that one the limbs are modified mainly for walking running in the case of for example ostrich the fastest bird which is running the one which is running fastly and also in the case of duck it is used for swimming and in the case of vulture it is used for clasping so different purposes and about the skin glands we have no skin glands normally the skin is dry except in one percent near the tail region normally called as cream gland or europhyngeal gland cream gland the one which is used for breeding the feather it's called as uropygeal gland also uropygeal gland as it is found near the tail pygidium near the anus or near the cleoca or excreted aperture that is why it's called uropygeal gland so preen gland is used for preening the feather preening nothing but actually cleaning the feathers making the feathers very lustrous that is the nature of this preen gland so all skin glands are absent normally the skin is dry except in one gland located just near the tail region near the clavicle aperture then while talking about the birds we have to give more importance for the endoskeleton the birds are greatly modified for its flight adaptations so always give concentration more about the skeletal structures particularly the bones number one a very peculiar character so, so preen glands, glands used for preening the feather. Preening means actually cleaning, preening, preening, making the feathers lustrous. So, from whom have mammals developed from, and is there any connecting link? So, the mammals have been developed also from the reptiles. We'll talk about again under the mammals, developed only from the reptiles mammal like animals even it has been actually 
said they have evolved from dinosaur like animals, reptilian animals. So because they were the largest animals lived in this world and we have originated only from that one. Okay. So about the actually the endoskeleton, the long bones are hollow with air cavities. This is a peculiar condition. We have bone marrow inside actually the bone cavity, what we call some the marrow cavity, the hollow bones. That is why we are very solid. We have very solid bones. Also more weight because of the presence of the bone marrow. But in the case of birds, <clears throat> but in the case of actually birds, we talk about actually Rabithicus and the Sivapithicus, we are not talking about the evolutionary process of man. We will come this one and the evolutionary process, I will give this more, okay, Sivapithicus, all these things about this evolutionary process, about uh, the mammalian evolution as well as what we have that is about the human evolution. Now. The long bones are hollow with air cavities. The endoskeleton is fully ossified. What is the meaning for that one? That means there are no cartilage bones in the case of bones. To reduce the weight, the bone is fully ossified. Though the bone is fully ossified, they are very thin. That is why. So, actually, we have the endoskeleton fully ossified. No cartilage is found in the case of bones. Then the skull is monocondyle. I mentioned about this one. So you have dicondylic condition in the case of amphibians and human beings and all other animals we have the reptiles just actually the birds see even the case of fishes it is monocondylic so fishes, reptiles and birds monocondylic in nature then about the nature of vertebrae a peculiar condition you could see in the case of birds vertebrae so you have the centrum, I mentioned just we have it may be acellus or procellus or ambicellus. That is cavity, concavity based on the nature of the concavity. So in our case it is called acellus. So that means the centrum has no cavity on either side. There is no concavity. Procellus we have cavity just at the anterior end. Amphicellus we have cavity just on both the sides. So in the case of heterocellus, a peculiar condition found only in the case of birds. You see that one, there is a concavity from side to side and just there is a convexity just normally. So I am drawing this one in different manner. Suppose you want to know better, just I will give you this manner for easy understanding. Now let's assume this is a letter sign. So in the case of heterocellus condition, we have concavity from side to side. And in dorsoventral dimensions, we have this actually convexity. You see that one, convexity. This type of vertebrae, where you have the centrum, actually concavity from side to side. And also we have convexity from just the dorsal to ventral directions. Then it is called heterocellus condition. Heterocellus. Don't forget the acellus, procellus, amphicellus, heterocellus. Then, there is a peculiar condition also. What we have in the case of, for example, sacrum. The pelvic girdle joins with the sacrum, the last part of what is called the vertebral column and also pocket. Sacrum is fused with what is called pelvic girdle in another case. In a similar manner, in a similar manner, so we have few thoracic, lumbar, as well as sacral vertebra and also few caudal vertebrae all fused together to form a, just what is called one pleat and that is called synsacrum. In our case, it is called simply sacrum. The sacral part alone, just actually, just actually, just the same sacrum, normally we have sacrum, the sacral plate fused actually formed with the fusion of many vertebrae. But in this case, a number of vertebrae are fused together to form a plate like structure, what we call this one, same sacrum, because the sacral plate is fused with the thoracic, lumbar, and a caudal vertebrae. In our case, only the sacral vertebrae alone fused together. But here you see that one the sacral plate along with the thoracic lumbar and caudal vertebrae fused from a single strut. Now the pectoralis major muscle in human evolved from birds are not. So that is not so. So even in the case of I mentioned just reptilosaurus, in the case of dinosaurs, though the animal had actually the wings, it is presumed that normally the wings have not been used by the animal for a long flight. So, we have the muscle, the pectoral is major muscle. It is not called as a major muscle, simply pectoral is muscle, one in the case of birds we can see. 
but somehow we can say there is a major mass of that it doesn't actually see I mentioned already we have evolved only from the reptiles not from the birds your question is actually a little different it is wrong also so once I say we have evolved from mammals then there is no question arises the muscles have been evolved from birds I mentioned parallel evolution the birds and mammals are evolved in two different lines parallelly from a single stock namely the reptiles so no need of answering this question ok remember then we will pass on to the next some of the other characteristics of what is called the endoskeleton so tail vertebrae fused form fibrous style a rod like structure the tail vertebrae some of the tail vertebrae the cox coccyx you know that one what we have and another character what we are talking about we have the pectoral is major pectoral is minor and coracobrachialis these are all the different types of flight muscles for the attachment of the flight muscles you see that one the sternum a wrong rod what we call this one the thoracic just actually bone the thoracic bone sternum it is provided with actually just a key, some spaces for the attachment of the flight muscles, for easy movement. So there is a peculiar cavity. And about the clavicle, so on either side you see that on the collarbone that is called as a clavicle. They fuse to form what is called a just a wishbone, a furcula or wishbone. So, furcula or wishbone. So like this, just actually the two clavicles are fused together like this, form a flat form uh, just what is called a plate like structure and that is called furcula or also called as wishbone as its appearance it is called as a wishbone now you see birds are peculiar in digestive process because they are taking actually the grains or the flesh along with the stones they never bother about whether they are taking the stones or not because they need stones in the case of for example grain eaters they need stones for grinding and there is a grinding in the stomach what we have here in this case being differentiated into two parts anterior part is called proventriculus anterior part sorry the stomach is actually glandular which is differentiated into what is called anterior proventriculus and a muscular gizzard which is acting as a grinding mill you may have seen even the case of for example chickens so it is horn in up its wall having actually inner lining thicker that is why the animal is taking stones also for just crushing the food while taking the grinds it is also taking the stones then also about this esophagus this is about the stomach that is proventriculus and muscular gizzard one of the characteristics as in the case of cockroach we have this gizzard here there you have chitinous place for crushing but these animals have thick walls only no chitinous place for that only they are taking stone salts along with now the esophagus is dilated into just what is called a storage bag what is called the crop even that one also secretes some milky fluid what we call this one pigeon's milk in the case of a pigeon a pigeon's milk is nothing but the secretion of the crop a milky secretion that is to be used to actually to feed their ducklings or even for example nestlings that is what about the crop storage no digestion address and about this heart the heart is for chimney as in the case of crocodiles or as in the case of mammals but there is one difference between the heart of uh, mammals and that of uh, just actually the birds if you are taking the heart see there is an artery leaving from the heart you know that one the name of the artery carrying into sorry pure blood to different parts of the body is called aorta. This is aorta, and a large blood vessel making its origin from the left ventricle carrying pure blood to different parts of the body. So while leaving from the heart, it forms an arch. So see that one. There is an arch being formed. Arch. It becomes actually leaving from the heart in the form of an arch see it may be towards what is called left side this is the left arch in some cases for example it may be towards the right like this this is the main difference between a bird now leave this one this is a aorta it leaves from the heart an arch forming a curve so this is what we call this one left aortic arch left aortic arch and this one what we have the right aortic arch 
So in the case of birds, we have right aortic arch, and in the case of mammals, we have left aortic arch. That's the main difference, mainly. Though the heart in four children, in the case of mammals, we have left aortic arch. It is actually bending towards the left side. That is aorta, and in the case of birds, it is actually bending towards the right. So, this is that difference, main difference. Don't forget because the question came also in the question paper. So, what is the nature of the arch? So, the mammals have right aortic arch, left aortic arch, both none. So, the mammals have left aortic arch, whereas the birds have right aortic arches. Then, so, and also if you are taking the ripple system, in the case of birds, we reduce the body weight. The right aortic arch is present and also the left ovary is present, the right ovary is absent. So right aortic arch is present and the right ovary is absent, it becomes vestige. So only one ovary is found in the case of birds in order to reduce the weight as the animal is you know that one flying. So remember that one, presence of right aortic arch and then absence of right ovary. Is a condition, one of the flight adaptations. Then about the portal system, so normally in the case of birds, in the case of reptiles, we have, just in the case of frog, we have both renal as well as hepatic portal system. But in the case of reptiles, the renal portal system is actually somehow developed, not fully developed. In the case of birds, we have the renal portal system is vestigial, non-functional. Only the hepatic portal system is well developed both in birds as well as in the case of mammals. See, there is evolutionary process. So it is somehow developed. So it is normally developed in the case of amphibians and fishes. Then less developed in the case of reptilian forms. It is vestigial in the case of actual birds. Completely absent in the case of mammals. We have only the hepatic portal system alone. No renal portal system. This was not so key. So which one of the following animals doesn't have renal portal system? That is, it's the mammal. In the case of mammals, there is no renal portal system. Now, the lungs are spawned. Even my dressing actually is found embedded along with the bones. As a general rule, in order to supply more oxygen, as animal is flying, so it needs more oxygen that is being supplied by actually nine assets connected to the lungs on either side we have four four in the middle one altogether there are nine assets connected to the lungs providing more and uh, far just providing more oxygen to release energy as animal is flying for a long duration now we have the voice box to produce the sound it is called as a larynx. In human beings, it is called as a larynx. The same one in the case of birds, it is called syrinx. This is another question. The voice box in the case of birds is called syrinx. Then about the nature of the kidney. So in the case of fishes and frog, if you are comparing that one in the case of fishes and frog, we have mesonephrine. In the case of reptiles, birds and mammals, we have metanephrine. And there is no doubt about it. In the case of both birds and reptiles, the acid material excreted as a waste product is uric acid. So it is one of the adaptations to conserve water because for eliminating uric acid it needs only less amount of water. Urea needs much amount of water. Ammonia needs large amount of water. That is why normally ammonia is a waste product in the case of aquatic animals. So here excreted product is uric acid. Then cranial loss 12 plants. So I mentioned already in the case of reptiles also 12 pairs, but in the case of snake only 10 pairs. So here 12 pairs of cranial knobs. Now one peculiar condition, one peculiar structure is also found projecting into the eye. Originating from the wall of the eye, projecting into the eye. So it is nothing but a vas vascular plate-like or plated projection. We can say vascular plate-like or plated projection into the cavity of the eye wall. The name of the structure normally for is called the pect on the right. It is as actually assumed that it is actually giving short vision. It is not so. It is mainly concerned with somehow protection, increasing actually the ability because even you know that one in front of the eye, we have sclerotic plates in the case of our birds. Because while the bird is flying, it is passing through the eye. 
In order to keep protection not to make the shape, just there are sclerotic plates found in the eye of course. A peculiar condition and adaptation for flight. Sclerotic plates on either side of eye to keep the eyeball in its shape. Sexes are separated normally in the case of no copulative organs, even the clavicle aperture, there is a single aperture, is acting as what is called a copulate organ. But in the case of some animals, the flightless birds are in the case of ducks and geese. They have some copulate strong. So ducks, geese and flightless birds, they have the copulating structure for transferring the sperm. But in the case of other animals, the birds, they do not have copulate organs. As a general rule, actually in the case of oviparous animals, fertilization is internal. As in the case of reptiles, they also have the extra embryonic membrane. That is why they are also included and then what is called amnios. They have chorea, amnion, and then choice and then yolksan. All the four membrane structures, extra embryonic, embryonic membranes are found both in uh, that is reptilian forms as well as in the case of uh, that is the birds. That is why they are considered as am that is amnios. Amnios. So in amnios, so the spelling is normally wrong, so amnios. So actually even the case of our mammals also we have actually the membrane is condition but the yolk sac is absent. No yolk sac in the case of our human beings but we have amnia, chorea and allantois. The fourth membrane is absent in mammals including human beings but in the case of reptiles and birds all the four extra membranes are formed. Now classification. So it is purely based on the nature of the birds. We are not taking into consider whether it is actually having some structures or not and based on their actual availability when they originate. So we have two different classes. One includes widely the ancient birds, another one includes the modern birds. So the first one subclass, the Aves class is includes Archaeornithus and Neoornithus. Now Archaeornithus includes the ancient birds, no such bird at first. The only bird which is survived, which is considered as a connecting link between the reptilian form and that is the birds, the Archaeopteryx, the one which became extreme. We have at present the stuffed specimen what in Berlin Museum. So it is considered as a connecting link between reptiles and birds, an extinct fossil bird, and it shows some of the characteristics similar to the reptilian forms. For example, the presence of a a digited claw, that is a claw is present in actually the wings and also the presence of teeth, the only bird which exhibited teeth in the beaks. So we will see the diagram there, or captainics, an extinct fossil bird. You see that one, toothed beak, it is a reptilian character. And also just in the wings, they have claws. So the claws are actually present only in the case of reptilian forms. It is actually a reptilian character, presence of teeth and also presence of claws in the wing. And normally they have the feathers for flight, they have a long tail, you can see that one. Now this is a specimen what we obtain as a fossil and it is being now stuck and stored. You can see the claws just actually the wings not specifically seen. Here we have the claws. So presence of teeth, presence of claws are actually considered as uh, that is uh, the reptilian characters. So the kidneys of birds pro-nephric or metanephric or epinephric. It is only metanephric. So reptiles, birds and mammals they have metanephric. So pro-nephric kidneys and ancestral kidney it is not present in any other forms except mixing. I mentioned already. So mixin, the cyclostomes, it has what is called the archinephric, namely the pronephric kidney. So during development, all these stages being formed, but in adults, we have metanephric kidney only in the case of reptiles as well as in the case of just birds and mammals. So what is pigeon's milk? Nothing but a secretion secreted by the crow. The region of the esophagus which becomes dilated, acting as a storage. When the food being stored there, the glands of the crop secrete some fluid and along with the milky fluid, some food being just being fed to the young ones or the nestlings and that is called pigeon's milk. Okay, now let's proceed to it. So 
the name of the animal Archaeopteryx lithographica, uh, an important bird, a connecting link between reptiles and birds, and also an extinct fossil bird. Now, subclass Neoornithus. <coughs> so, though we have a number of orders, <coughs> it includes only three living orders with some animals. Number one, superorder Paleonath. Some of ancient. So, these include Rachidapans. These are all nothing but flightless running birds. Flightless running birds. The second one, so broader, it, this one also in penny, which also includes the flightless birds, but these are all the aquatic birds. So, birds are not mammals. Birds are not mammals. I mentioned already, birds are not mammals. Because we have originated only from the reptilian forms, not from the birds. So, in penny, which includes penguins, the flightless aquatic birds. And the modern birds are included under the superorder Neonathi, also called as carinating modern flying birds. So we have flightless running birds, we have aquatic flightless birds, and also modern flying birds. Thank you for your listening. So the class is complete.